Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the pastimes of His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj. In the next two or three days, they will be celebrating his 15th true birth anniversary in Kitanagri in the USA, where Maharaj left his body. Of course, the, the actual date of his disappearance is on the 27th of June. But the TT varies from year to year. So I guess this year it is earlier than the actual date. So on the request of Sri Keshava Prabhu, we are sitting here to say a few words about His Holiness Bhakti Theta Swami Maharaj. Actually, to speak about Bhakti Theta Maharaj requires a certain qualification which I do not have. When his Holiness Radhanath Maharaj spoke about Bhakti Tita Maharaj. It took him more than five hours yeah, in Radha Gopina Temple when Maharaj disappeared from this planet. And Radhanath Maharaj was with him till the end. He came back to India and he gave a Sunday class said he was going to speak for two hours and he ended up speaking for five hours plus. And he said that was just a gist. <laughs> it was just a gist of the activities of Bhakti Theater Maharaj. So, uh, I don't see myself qualified enough to speak about such an exalted personality but for my own purification, for my own spiritual progress, I think Maharaj is very kind to arrange that I speak about him. So what I intend to do is to mention a few points in the different stages of his life and maybe add a few anecdotes that I have heard or seen to those incidences of his life. Beginning with his birth, it is mentioned that Maharaj was the last born of six children. The first four were all girls. The fifth born was a boy. And this boy is called Paul because all his, his siblings were girls. She was, he was the only boy. And he wasn't feeling very happy in the family. So they said that this boy, Paul, he, he had a doll. He had a doll he played with. And his prayer was that if his mother is going to bring forth another child, he should be a boy. So that he can have a playmate. Because he didn't like playing with his sisters, as he was the only boy in their family. So they said that whatever was given to this boy, Paul, he would divide it into two. 
and he will put aside the other half and he will say, this is for my brother. Even though the brother wasn't born, the mother wasn't even conceived, but he would divide everything he had with his brother. So finally, when the mother got conceived, nobody knew what was going to happen. But this Paul was 100% convinced that the next child of his mother was going to be a boy. Because that's what he was praying for. That's what he was meditating on all the time. And lo and behold, when Pelin, their mother is called Pelin, when she delivered the baby, he was a boy. So the most happiest person in the family was Paul. Because that's what he had been meditating on and praying for. And it happened. Of course, it also mentioned that um, of all the f- six children, it was John Favors, Bhaktitita Maharaj's birth name is John Edward Favors. So, it is said that of the six children, the birth of John Favors was the most difficult for the mother. For the other five children, it was very easy for her to deliver. But when it came to John's birth, she was in labor for hours. And the child won't come out. So there was a lot of anxiety. What was going to happen? Whether the child will come out, whether she won't come out, whether the mother will deliver safely, she won't deliver safely. There was a lot of anxiety. But eventually, the child came out. So according to Sutta Raj Prabhu, who is the author of The Black Lotus, which is the summary of Bhaktivedanta Maharaj's pastimes, it is understood that Maharaj was hesitant to come into the material world. <laughs> that is such a right Prabhu's interpretation of that delayance in delivery. He said Maharaj was hesitant to come out of the mother's womb to experience material life. So he was, he was debating whether to come or not to come. But of course, he had to come because Krishna has some service for him in this material world. So even though he was reluctant, but Krishna said, you must come out. You must come and do your service. So eventually, he came out. But it is also reported that that was the only problem the mother had with him. When he was born, he was the best of all the children. But he never gave one trouble to the mother. He never gave one trouble to anybody in the family. He was such a good child that he was never even beaten once. All the other brothers and sisters, the parents would always beat them for their naughtiness. But John Favors was actually the favor of the family. He was never beaten. He was never chastised because he will always act properly. It is said that he was a moralist. He always wanted the right thing to be done, even from his childhood. And if his sisters and brothers would do something wrong, he would point out to them that this is not good. What you are doing will not please Papa. It will not please Mama. So don't do it. So that was the kind of a child that he was. He was upright, moralist, and throughout his life, he never gave any difficulty to his parents. So he was loved for that. When he went to school, he was a very brilliant child. Of course, he was born into a a poor family. Uh, he was born in the in Ohio State, Cleveland, in a ghetto. 
in America, those who are very poor, they live in very degraded, very poor areas. Uh, so his parents were not rich. Poor Af Af African Americans who had some little job to do just to maintain their family. So they did not have enough money to rent a high class place or to live uh, a high class life. But they were satisfied with whatever they had. So, but Bhakti Chita Maharaj, when he went to school, he was very brilliant. And so his teachers liked him. Then the choir master, a lady, she, Vivian, Vivian Jordan, she liked him very much. So he saw the uh, saintliness in Bhakti Chita Maharaj, even at that age. The age of seven, eight, nine, and ten. Vivian said he saw that this boy was a God sent personality because he could sing very nicely. He was a natural leader. It is said that one time the, uh, Vivian was late. She was the choir master. And so she was late to come to, this, to the church. The church was near the school and they will have their practice in this classroom. So when the, 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 the choir master came, was late, he asked somebody to come ahead of time to open one of the classrooms for the children to wait for her. And that person also came late. So when they got there, when the children got there, all the classrooms were closed and there was nobody there. So immediately, John Favors, Bhakti Chita Maharaj, started thinking what to do. There were some boys who were older than him and some were younger than him. But they were not all concerned about what to do. But he was thinking what to do. So he asked the boys to carry him on his shoulder. He saw that one window at the top, the lock was not in. So the window was partly open. So he told the older boys, carry me on your shoulders. I will try to open this window and I will go into the classroom and I will open the door from behind and we will enter and sit down and wait for our, our choir master. So the older boys carried him on their shoulders. He pulled the window open. He jumped through the window. He opened the door and all the children came in. And immediately he took charge. He took control. He started organizing the choir even before they the person who was sent by the, um, the choir master to come ahead of time. Before he came, John Favors had already organized all the children. And he was already teaching a song. They were already singing in the classroom. So he was surprised to see that. And so then later the lady, uh, Vivian, came, thinking that it was the person which he, he, she sent who organized. And the guy said, no. By the time I got here, I was late. But John had already organized, he has climbed over the window, he has opened the door, and he was organizing the children. So from that moment, they all realized that John Favors was a leader by nature. And so, he was active in the in this choir group, and later he became the leader of the choir group. And so, they were invited to different places in the United States. They went to Washington, D.C. to sing on Christmas Eve, different places to perform. He was always leading them very nicely. And then in school, as I said, he was very brilliant. So he won scholarship to go to the senior high school. And then there he won scholarship to go to the university, Princeton University. He had a full paid scholarship. His tuition paid, his lodging and boarding paid, everything was paid. Somehow or the other, because his parents were poor, if he had not 
won that scholarship. It would have been difficult for him. But because he was so brilliant in school, he won a full scholarship, including everything, even clothes and tippin, some little monies were given to him for expenses. So this way, he went through his college education. But his desire was to go to Africa. Even when he was in college, he had one desire. Because as an African-American, he, he knew his, 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 um, his uh, great-grandparents. They came from Africa. So he was desiring that I must trace my origin. So while he was studying, his plan was, as soon as I finished my college degree, I finished my university degree, I want to work in Africa so that I can be able to trace my roots in Africa. So by the time he completed his uh, university education, his professors had arranged a teaching engagement for him in one university in Africa. And they had his ticket paid. Everything was arranged. But that was not Krishna's plan. Krishna's plan was he has to first of all join ISKCON, trained by Prabhupada, prepared as a preacher before he will go to Africa. So the desire to go to Africa would be fulfilled. But it wasn't time for him to go to Africa. So just at the time he completed his, his university program and he was serving with the uh, penal reform system in New Jersey, he came across the devotees. He came across Krishna consciousness. In fact, from the very beginning of his life, he was inclined to spiritual activities. He was, he was recognized as someone who was gifted spiritually. In fact, it is said, even at the age of 9, 10, he was preaching in the church. And he was preaching on radio and television. He was born with a defect, a speech defect. It was difficult for him to, pro to pronounce one word without stamping his leg on the ground. It would take him hours to say one thing. So he was always very quiet in class because when he speaks, it will cause laughter. The whole class will laugh. So because of that, he always kept shut. He never talked in class. But something wonderful happened. Anytime he would mount the pulpit, any time he was to preach in the church, the stammering would go away. Amazingly, to everybody's surprise, he would not stum stammer again. He would preach from beginning to end without any single stammer. But as soon as he come off from the pulpit, as soon as he finished preaching, he cannot speak again. So Marai said that actually it was Krishna's mercy. He understood that Krishna did not want him to engage in prajalpa. <laughs> that even from birth, Krishna did not want him to get involved in talking so many unnecessary things. So Krishna gave him that defect, <laughs> speech defect, to give him to keep him shut. But when he came to the issue of speaking about God, the defect went away, and he could speak as he wanted. But as soon as he finished speaking, again, the defense will come. Like that. In fact, he said even when he became a devotee, it was still there, very, very minute, very smiled. Sometimes we could feel in a very minute way. But if he said, so long as the preaching was concerned, he never experienced that uh, effect. Anytime you want to speak about anything else, it was very difficult for him. People laugh at him because just one word to come out of his mouth. So, um, 
these authorities, even in the primary school, elementary school, they notice how spiritual he was, they notice how religious he was, and so they encouraged him to preach. And so he became a child evangelist. From the age of nine, ten, he started preaching in the church, he started preaching on radio, he started preaching on television, and he became very popular. People always wanted to listen to him because he would always speak very nicely, very eloquently, quoting very good examples and verses from the Bible. And this way, they, they, they saw him as an upcoming uh, preacher in the church. But unfortunately, uh, he, he never ended up in that church. From the university, he joined the Hare Krishna movement and became a very powerful preacher. In the university also, he became a student leader. He became the president of the student council. In fact, Marai said he realized that any leadership position he contested, he will always win. Even though he sometimes felt he was an underdog, he was not as uh, capable of his, as his competitors. He was not as popular as his competitors. But any election that he will participate in, he will emerge the winner. It was surprising for him and for his mates in school. But he realized that he was a natural leader. So, then also, he, he got exposed to some extraterrestrial experience when he was a young boy. One of his classmates was possessed by uh, an, uh, an unidentified uh, extraterrestrial being. The boy was about 10 years old, the same age of Bhaktivedanta Maharaj. And one day, he just became kind of paralyzed. And he could not get up. He was just lying down. He can't get up. He cannot eat. For two weeks, he was on, on, the, on the bed. And he became uh, possessed that he could tell what was going to happen in the future. When people would come into the room, this boy could read their minds. He could tell them what they were thinking about. He could tell them what is going to happen to them. He was possessed. So, and this boy was very close. Actually, they were cousins. They were cousins. So, Marai said, he was very close to a boy. And he witnessed this for the two weeks. Every day, he would be with this boy. So, he, he got the feeling he got experience that there is a superior force beyond this physical environment. He understood there were superior authorities that controlled the lives of living entities. So he said from that moment, he became interested in uh, extraterrestrial uh, beings, knowledge, and experiences. So when he was in college, he was in university, he did psychology and he specialized in parapsychology because of the background, that experience he got with this boy, he felt that one could be, uh, one could have some experiences with some uh, other beings beyond this universe. So he studied psychology and did parapsychology as his field of speciality. And so there they could retrogress people into their previous lives. He said they did a number of experiments. They could retrogress somebody into their previous life. And people could speak a language they could not speak while they were conscious. But when they were retrogressed into their previous life, they would speak a language entirely different. So 
This experience also gave Marai the, the, the understanding of previous night reincarnation. So he started taking instructions from one yogi. There was a yogi, a mystic yogi, that Maharaj was interested in learning more about this uh, extraterrestrials into previous life, into clairvoyance, into clairaudience, into telepathy. He was into all these things. And so he started learning from one yogi. But the yogi told him that I am not your guru. So that yogi told him, your guru is the Hare Krishna spiritual master. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. He is the person who is qualified to accept you as a disciple. I am not qualified. So the yogi told him like this. Even though the yogi was giving him some lessons in mystic you know, practices, mystic yoga, it was me, but the yoga, yogi told him, I am not your guru. So he was wondering, how is he going to meet this A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And so one day, in the, on the campus, he said they were going for lectures, and the devotees came to their campus. They were doing Hari now. So the first time he saw the devotees, he was wondering, are these some of the extraterrestrials? <laughs> so he was wondering, I did some of the astrologers who have descended on the campus because they said the weather was very cold. It was winter time and people were in heavy, heavy dresses. But these devotees were simply wearing light jackets and they were performing kirtan. They were dancing and sweating in the cold. And so he was passing to the lectures and he saw them. He was wondering, where from these people? Are they part of this earth or they are coming from another planet? So he passed to lectures. And then after the lectures, he was coming back, and to his surprise, these people were still there singing and dancing. <laughs> so he said he, be, he became very concerned. He said, these people, I must find out about them. What energy do they have? What is their connection? What is their source for them to stay inside this cold for such a long time? And they are not even looking very miserable. They are very happy. So he said, because of that, he bought some books from them. And when he read, he realized, yes, this is where he belonged. So he said, just by reading those books, he was convinced that Krishna consciousness is the best thing to do. So according to Maharaj, one day, he just packed his bag and baggage and moved to the New York Temple. When he got there, they didn't take him very serious. Because normally they preach to people, they try to convince people to join. But it was difficult to even make devotees, to just move into the temple like that. And then all of a sudden, this young man just appeared with his back and said he wants to join the temple. So the temple authorities didn't take him serious. They thought he was just one of those uh, bombs on the street who had no place to sleep, who were looking for something to eat, and that's why he has come. The Mara said, no, no, no. I have a job. I'm working with the penal system in New Jersey. I have a home. I have a flat. I have given out all my property to my friends. I've given up my job, and I want to serve. I've read the books of the AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And one yogi I was attending to told me that AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada is my guru. So when I came across these books, I traced the temple and I went to meet him. That's what I'm here. So after a lot of talking back and forth, they, said they allowed him to stay on probation. And so around that time, too, also Prabhupada, Prabhupada also came the New York Temple. And Maharaj met him. And Prabhupada encouraged him to stay. But then, at that time, they started the Dallas Gurukula. And because he was a degree holder, Prabhupada recommended that they should send him to Dallas for teaching. They, they needed teachers. 
at the Guru Pool. So immediately he was sent to Dallas. On that time, Krishna Goswami Maharaj. And so he was teaching there, but he would listen to devotees talk about book distribution. And they will all say that Shla Prabhupada is very happy with his book distributors. He was always hearing people talking about book distribution. At that time, Sasaru Maharaj was the uh, personal secretary of Shla Prabhupada. And later on, Tamakrishna Maharaj took over. And Sasaru Maharaj was now heading the, 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 the library party. The library party was a collection of brahmacharis and sannyasis who traveled throughout the U.S. and they were going from university to university, library to library, and presenting Shla Prabhupada's books and getting standing orders. Even though the books were yet to be printed, but in colleges and universities, they will order for the books ahead of time and they will even pay for them ahead of time. So Sansaru Maharaj was in charge of that group. And so, they traveled, he traveled his group and they came to Dallas. So when they came to Dallas, Sazaru Maharaj gave the class and emphasized the importance of distribution of Shri Prabhupada's books and how Shri Prabhupada is very, very happy with his book distribution. He's very satisfied. He's pleased with those who are engaged in book distribution. So he said after the class, he met Sazaru Maharaj and inquired from him. Uh, how best he could actually please Prabhupada. So the Rupara said, if you want to please Prabhupada, then you must join us in this Yagya, in this book distribution. So, uh, he had to approach his authorities and pleaded with them to allow him to join the book distribution party. It took some time, but actually finally they allowed him. So, Maharaj joined the book distribution party with Sansa Maharaj. And they started traveling the whole U.S. and then they covered most of the universities and then they traveled to Europe, Britain, Germany, Switzerland. They covered most of the European countries. At that time, there was no preaching going on in the, in the Eastern Bloc. At that time, it was called the, the Communist Bloc. The Soviet Union and most of the countries there, they were all practicing communism. And so it was not open to religious matters. He wasn't open to things of this nature. So the Maharaj, after they toured most of Europe, he realized that the, the, um, the communist bloc was untouched. So he decided to go there alone. So he went to Eastern Europe. Initiation. Yes, okay. So Maharaj took initiation 1973. 1973. He said he had joined the temple in 72. And after a year, he got initiated in 73. And, and then he gave me the, like, uh, Shabbat gave me the name Ghana Sham. Ghana Sham. That's Krishna's name. As, and uh, Satya Raj Prabhu said, that name has a very deep meaning. That Prabhupada gave him the name Ghana Sham, uh, indicating that he was a servant of Krishna as Ghana Sham, but that Bhakti Tita Maharaj will also serve Sham in Ghana. <laughs> so that's, that's the interpretation. Such a right Prabhu gave that Prabhupada understood that in the future this is devotee will visit Africa and he will preach in Nigeria, he will preach in Ghana, he will preach in many countries in West Africa, in Africa. And so the name Ghana Sham was indicating that he will carry Lord Sham to Ghana. <laughs> and actually he did. He did. So it was Ghana Sham, a brahmachari. So that's when he started the preaching and the, and the traveling. So in, in, the, in the Eastern Europe, he was there. He performed a lot of austerities in Eastern Europe. 
In fact, even in the uh, in the traveling party, in the in the um, the um, the library party, his colleagues, Mahabudi Prabhu says that Dr. Tita Maharaj was a very special soul. He said he did things that even they, as older members of the team, could not do. He said his eating was very austere. He had a certain quota of books he would distribute before he would eat on daily basis. If he does not distribute a certain number of books, he will not eat. So that was a tax he set for himself. And what was his food? Carrot, uh, cucumbers, granite. That was his food. Very austere. And then he told us one story that one time they were traveling from one state to another state. And then it was a Sunday. And they came across a very small university campus. And as soon as they came across the university campus, they wanted to drive past the university. And Dr. Tita Mara said, no, no, no. I feel like going to the gents. So stop here. I want to use the university gents. Because I don't know the next town, how far we are from the next town. So they said they stopped at the gate. And Dr. Tita Mara got down. He went into the campus. And for more than one hour, they were waiting. He was not coming. So Mahabudi was very angry. He was the leader of the team at that time. He was very angry why Maharaj was delaying them. And after more than an hour and a half, Maharaj emerged. And he saw a very beautiful smile on his face. So he was angry, but when he saw his smile, he understood something auspicious had happened. So he decided to shelve his own anger first listen to what he has to tell him before he will vent his anger on him. <laughs> so he said, okay, tell me, what, why, do you waste, why do you waste our time like this? Why do you delay so much like this? And Maharaj said, don't worry. I have some good news for you. He said, what is the good news? He said, yes. When I went into the, uh, the campus, I came across a, a library. And I saw a librarian cleaning the library. So I asked him where I could ease myself. So he showed me the toilets. I went and eased myself. And I, while I was in the toilet, it just occurred to me, I should introduce Prabhupada's books to this librarian. So when I came back, I spoke with him. And he said, actually, he doesn't have the authority to, to order books. But that he could call the, the li librarian to come. Even though it was a Sunday, he could order the books. He was just assisting. So they called a librarian, and the librarian said, I'm already on my way to the library, but I have some work to do. So he soon arrived, and Maharaj met him, and they discussed, and the librarian was very happy. He, he ordered for whether 10 sets of Bhagavatam, and 10 sets of Jitanya Charitamrita, and 10 sets of all kinds of books, because it was, a, it was a theological university. So all the departments needed a set of Bhagavatam, set of Chaitanya Charitamrita. So the whole university department, they all they ordered for all. And so that was a good news that Maharaj brought. So Mahabudi said that this person, you can never imagine what he can do. That he was so empowered that even just going to just going to ease himself, he came back distributing so many sets of Prabhupada's books. So that is Bhakti Chita Maharaj. He was such an empowered soul. So, in the Eastern Europe, European country, he was there alone, distributing Prabhupada's books. He told us a number of stories how the KGB, the, um, the, um, the, 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 the security, they were always trailing behind him. Because here he is a black body in a strange country. So it was very easy for him to be identified. So he has to play some games to be able to distribute his books. He said he has to live on trains. He would buy a ticket, enter one train. The KGB would trace him. He would leave one train and join another train. And the KGB would pass with that train. <laughs> he was so smart. 
that a KGB couldn't trace him. Never. And then uh, sometimes in the university, they will be trailing him from behind. He has to dodge from room to room, from office to office, from, from department to department, just to dispute our passports. So like this. Uh, and then he was giving a daily report of his book distribution to Shabba Obad. It is said that Tamakrishna Maharaj was the secretary of Shabba Obad. And Shabba Obad told Tamakrishna Maharaj that uh, all the mails that he was receiving daily, the first mail he wanted to hear was from Ganesha. That's what Tamakrishna Maharaj of all the mails that come to me, the first mail I want to read, or I want to hear, is the mail from uh, Nanasham Das, from Acharya. So, the Maharaja Maharaj received the mails, we will go through and see, and those days we don't have internet, it was all by snail, snail mail, post, post, you have to post it through the post office, stamp on it, post it to the post office. So he will go through and then he will see the address where it's coming from. And he will see this is Dana Sham's letter. Then he will open it and sometimes Prabhupada will say, read it. And then Tamakrishna Maharaj will read it to Prabhupada's very and sometimes Prabhupada will just take the letter and read it himself on the side. So like this, Tamakrishna Maharaj told me this one how his letters were actually very enthusing. Papa was always eager to hear how many books he distributed, his preaching experiences, his new areas of, of preaching, and he was always giving a full report of what he was doing on the preaching front. So like this, uh, he, he distributed the Prabhupada's books in the universities, in the Eastern Bloc, in the Communist Bloc, until uh, later on, he got involved in some accident, he knocked somebody down, and uh, he has to leave the country because they were really after him. They wanted to get him arrested, and locked him up, so he escaped, went through Germany, and finally met Mr. Prabhupada in, uh, in London. And then that was when it is said that Prabhupada gave him a very special blessing. When, uh, in 1976, Prabhupada wanted to go to uh, He was on his way to Kitanagri because he wanted to establish this uh, Vanashwan Dharma in Kitanagri farm. But when he got to London, he became very sick that he could not travel any longer. So all the devotees around the world, they had to come to meet the Prabhupada in London. So at that time, Dr. Tita Baraj also arrived in London. He escaped the arrest in the communist bloc, and he came to London. So uh, in London, when, when he arrived, Tamakrishna Baraj informs the Prabhupada that Narasham Prabhu is here. And, and, and uh, Prabhupada said, bring him in. So, According to Maharaj himself, so uh, Tamakrishna Maharaj invited Bhaktivedanta Maharaj into the Prabhupada's presence. And then he sat in bit of essences and sat up. And Prabhupada said, Come closer. So he got up and he went and sat in front of Prabhupada's desk. And Prabhupada said, No, come around like this. So he got up and then he went around to Prabhupada's desk. And that's when he sat down, Krishna Prabhupada and raised him and said, that because you are sacrificing, you are risking your life in trying to distribute my books in the communist bloc. I am very happy with you, and your life has become successful. So, in this way, Mr. Prabhupada uh, actually gave him the boon that in this, in this very life he would attain perfection. Because he had sacrificed and risked his life in distributing books in the communist 
block. Then, uh, Shinobu left the planet in 1977. And in 1979, he said he used to go to my airport every year. Uh, we, we had the different pastimes of serving to shout in my airport. Uh, Alitama, Alitama Kumu told us a story how Dr. Tito Maharaj used to serve the devotees from beginning to end. And every day, he would be among the people who would serve. And he would then serve those who have served. At the end of it all, all the Pushadam is gone. He has nothing to eat. And Ganesha would just smile. Uh, Tama Prabhu said, he started observing him, that he would see him serving the devotees, and then he would see him serving the servers, and at the end when the, the Pushadam is finished, Ganesha would just take his feet back, smile, and go away. So he noticed that was such an austere devotee, he noticed that he was such a wonderful Vaishnav because he was always eager to serve others and he didn't even bother about his own convenience. So, he said in 1979, he met Sasaru Maharaj, who was his leader in the Muk party. And Sasaru Maharaj said, Ganesha, you have done a lot of service with Prabhupada, you visited a lot of books, you risked your life with Prabhupada. Why don't you want to take sanyas and preach? Now that Prabhupada has left the planet, you have to take a leadership role and spread Prabhupada's mission. And according to Maharaj, he said, well, he doesn't consider himself qualified enough to uh, take sanyas. But Sasuke Maharaj urged him to do that. He said, when he went back to America, approached with another Swami who was then the Acharya for the Mandapa and the eastern part of, of America. Eastern part of America. So he approached Kitananda Maharaj and Kitananda Maharaj accepted to give him sannyas. So um, on the initiation day Generally, the names of the devotees are not changed. If somebody is, uh, say, uh, Bhavananda, his name was, they just added a Swami. Bhavananda Swami, if he's a householder, it was because Swami was added. If it's a Brahmachari, Swami was added. But when he came to Bhakti Tita Maharaj, Kitananda Swami changed his name. He was expecting Ganesham Swami. That's what he was expecting from Kitananda Swami. But then, Kitananda Maharaj gave him the name Bhakti Tirta Swami. Completely different. It was the first time that this happened in the history of his Khan. So everybody was surprised. But then when he asked Kitananda Swami, he said, because your life you are leading such a holy life. You are, you, are, you are changing so many people's lives. You are touching so many people's lives. Wherever you go, that place will become a holy place. So therefore, the name Tirta, Bhakti Tirta, is appropriate. That by practicing Bhakti and by carrying the message of Bhakti, you can convert everywhere and everybody into a holy place. So that is how he got his name, Bhakti Tito Maharaj, instead of Ganesham Maharaj. And we see that actually Maharaj, he did a, a lot of wonderful preaching. He changed a lot of people. He touched many people's lives. Uh, with his preaching. We see that in, 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 before he came to Africa, actually, before he, 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 he decided to come to Africa, some preaching was going in, in Africa. Uh, there was preaching going on in East Africa, in Nairobi, 
There was preaching going on in South Africa, in Durban, in Johannesburg, and different devotees were in charge. Ramananda Swami was in charge of the East African preaching, and Pusta Krishna Swami was in charge of the preaching in South Africa. But Ramananda Swami also told us that Srila Prabhupada wanted him to preach to the local African people. But in Nairobi, Ramananda was preaching to the Indian population. And so when Prabhupada visited uh, Kenya, he wasn't satisfied. When a lot of the Indian population came to attend programs and a very few Africans, Prabhupada told Ramananda, I want you to preach to the local African people. So after Prabhupada left the planet, Brahmananda decided to come to West Africa. So he came to West Africa in 78, 79, and started alone and was trying to preach. But it was not very easy for him. So around that time, Bhakti Tita Mara had taken Sanyas in 79, and he had wanted to embark on urban spiritual development. He wanted to do preaching projects in the cities in order to influence many city dwellers into Krishna consciousness. But then according to Maharaj, he had a dream. One night he dreamt that Srila Prabhupada had told him that let the African people come in. And the dream ended. After a few days again, he had the same dream again. He dreamt Prabhupada telling him, let the African people come in. Then the third time he had the same dream, he opened the door. When the Prabhupada said, let the African people come in, he opened the door. And a lot of black devotees, they rushed into Prabhupada's room. And he woke up and he understood that Shri Prabhupada wanted him to go to Africa to preach. So immediately, he stopped all his uh, urban spiritual development programs in Washington, D.C., and immediately embarked on going to Nigeria to support Ramananda Swami, who had already started doing some preaching work in West Africa. So uh, to the two of them, they started traveling from country to country, they started traveling from university to university, and they started distributing Shri Prabhupada's sets of books, set of Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamritas, to all the universities in West Africa. And then they also started preaching, doing Sankirtan in the street. And as a result, the first set of devotees began to visit where they were staying. But where they were staying was a small place, a two bedroom flat that could not contain many people. So they were there for some time, and then eventually they got an Indian uh, company that had a, a, a hospital, they had rented a hospital, a big place, and the rent was still there for another two years, and they had relocated the hospital somewhere else, and the place was lying empty, so they decided to allow Iskon to start a temple there. So in 1980, December 1980, the temple, the first temple was opened in Lagos and devotees began to, to join. So, um, the preaching in West Africa actually took off in a very wonderful way when Bhaktivedanta Maharaj arrived. When Brahmananda alone was there, he was just going on the street trying to distribute some books, trying to influence the local people. The people were not responding so much. But when Bhakti Tita Maharaj arrived, and then now because people could identify with his body, his color, yeah, Bhakti, Bhakti Tita Maharaj told us that Krishna actually gave him this black body just to use him to bring a lot of black people into Krishna consciousness. So that, that's, that's why Krishna gave him that black body. So when the, when the people in Nigeria saw that there was a white swami and a black swami together preaching, they became attracted. And many devotees joined. And of course, we can also say that Bhaktivedanta Maharaj, his way of doing things, 
He was very dynamic. His kirtans, his lectures, his speeches, his relationship, everything about him was very dynamic. It was very inspiring. One could not uh, avoid him in any way. Once you meet him, once you get in touch with him, you want to stay with him. So, um, personally, I met Bhaktitita Maharaj in, in, uh, in December 1981. At that time, I was a student and I was supposed to uh, go on scholarship. But uh, my temple authorities did not want me to go on the scholarship. They felt I should join the temple and become a full-time preacher. So there were finding ways and means to stop me from, from my studies and make me a full-time devotee. So they would invite me to the temple to spend weekends. And I enjoyed the association of devotees. I enjoyed kirtans. I enjoyed the lectures. I enjoyed prashadam. I even sometimes joined the devotees on preaching, go on Harinam and book distribution. So like that. And then finally, as Krishna wanted it, there was a need for the, the, the Sankirtan leader in Ghana to go to Nigeria to get some books because they were, the books in Ghana had finished and they needed books. And those days also the economy of Ghana was good. The economy of Nigeria was, was booming, but the economy of Ghana was bad. So you could not even get essential commodities like toothpaste, like bathing soap, washing soap, things like that you could not get. You have to queue in a long, long line just to get one bar of soap. But in Nigeria, these things were just everywhere. So it was decided that the Sankitan leader take the, the temple bus, go to Nigeria, and then get the books and also buy some essential commodities for the temple. And at that time, I was the only devotee, I'm the only a person in the temple who had a, a passport, a, a traveling passport, because I had won a government scholarship and I was supposed to travel out of the country, so I was given a passport and I was in the waiting. So they said, oh, since you have a passport, please accompany the, the, the Sankitan leader to Nigeria for two weeks, you bring the books, and then you can go on your scholarship. But it was all Krishna's plan. So, in Nigeria, we had to travel to group distribution in order, in order to raise money to buy the essential commodities for the temple in Ghana. While we were on Sankitan, it was around December, we heard that Bhaktichita Maharaj had arrived in Lagos. And we have been hearing about him, his dynamic classes, his dynamic kirtans, his dynamic japra, his everything. He was such a special personality. So everybody was eager to meet him. So when we had the Bhaktichita Maharaj arrive in Lagos, we decided that that very day, we we're going to make sure we distributed all the books in the van and then return to Lagos to meet Bhaktichita Maharaj. We're far away in the east of Nigeria. So we went on the marathon from morning to evening. We distributed all the books and by the evening, five o'clock, every book was gone. And so we traveled all night to Lagos, just to get there exactly the time the Mangalarati program had started. And Bhakti Tita Maharaj, he was leading the Kirtan. So we jumped in, practically jumped out of the bus, and we entered the Kirtan. And Bhakti Tita Maharaj was leading such a static, roaring Kirtan that we participated in. And after that, the Japa, and after the Japa Guru Puja, after the Guru Puja, he gave the class. And the class was just out of the blue. The class was so wonderful that everybody was feeling this is what we all need. And then after that, Maharaj invited me to his room. He told my Sankirtan leader, I want to speak to your doctor, Sylvester. So I was invited to Maharaj's room. And Maharaj asked me what I wanted to do with my life. I said, well, I am a student and I have, I have to go on scholarship to study, so uh, that's my plan. I said, no, better you become a devotee and preach Krishna consciousness, distribution of Prabhupada's books, 
that will make you happy than going to Russia to study medicine. You become a drunkard. In Russia, they drink only vodka. They don't drink water. They drink alcohol. You become an alcoholic and your life will spoil. So please don't go there. But anyway, he said, I'm not forcing you. You think about it and come back and meet me. So I left. I went to my Sankitan leader and I told him what Marai told me. And the Sankitan leader said, you are such a fortunate soul that Bhakti Jita Marai is personally asking you to become a devotee. You must consider yourself very fortunate. If I were you, I will go and shave my head, I will wear tilak, I will wear dhoti, and I will go and pay obeisances to him. So I, I decided to leave him. I went to meet the, uh, the Bhakta leader. There was a one devotee from the U.S., Oman Pati Prabhu, he was a Bhakta leader. So I went to him and I also informed him that I went to see Maharaj, and this is what Maharaj told me. He said, wow, you are such a fortunate soul. But Tita Maharaj is personally requesting you to become a devotee. Why don't you just shave up, put on the tilak, wear dhoti, and go and meet Maharaj? At that time, I have not shaved. Then I left him, and I went to the temple president, Patamrita Prabhu, and I said, this is what I've heard Maharaj told me. What should I do? He said, wow, you are such a wonderful soul. Just go and shave your head, just put on tilak, wear dhoti, and go pay obeisances to Maharaj, and get his blessings. So when I heard from these three senior Vaishnavas, Saying this exactly the same thing, I felt well, this is what my life should be now. So immediately I went out, I got one devotee to put a sika, shave my head, I got some new devotees I wore, I put on tilak, I knocked at Maragi's door, and he said, Who is that? I said, Back to Sylvester, I said, Come in. I went inside, I paid obeisance to him, and he said, Jai, like this. And then he started rubbing my head with his two hands, not two hands. And I think that rubbing of my head is what has maintained me till today. <laughs> that mercy he gave me is what has maintained me till today. So that's how I met Bhakti Chita Maharaj. That was December 25th, 1981. And then uh, from there, he took so much interest in me. He immediately he gave me some very special service. I should take over the BBT. I became a BBT manager. I was his assistant, his, his secretary, his servant. I was washing his clothes. I was bringing his prasadam. I was doing everything for him while he was in Nigeria. And so my relationship began to develop from there. Um, Dr. Tita Maharaj is a very special personality, very special. I have witnessed in his preaching that anybody he met will never forget him. He has met very distinguished people. He, he has met many heads of states in Africa. Amongst them, President Kaunda of Zambia, President Rawlings of Ghana, President Mandela, Nelson Mandela of South Africa, President Momo of Sierra Leone, President Obasanjo of Nigeria. Maraj has met all these presidents, and they were very impressed with him because Maraj is such a gifted person that he could understand people's minds. He could speak their language. I have witnessed Maharaj preach to police officers. I have witnessed him preach to uh, insurance brokers. I have witnessed him preach to prison officers, to accountants, to pharmaceutical pharma pharmacists. And Maharaj will just speak the message that suited them and that convinced them of Krishna consciousness. So, also his media preaching was very special. In Ghana, he, anytime he would come, we would arrange for him to speak on television, on radio, we we'll invite newspaper to come and interview him. And so he was very popular in Ghana. Nigeria also, many television programs, many radio programs. People love his preaching and they will always give him program. In Ghana, 
again, did one program which was so powerful. In those days, we used to have one television station. And so, when you speak, the whole country will watch it. The whole country. So, just one station. So, Marat gave such a powerful lecture that the head of state saw it. President Dr. Rawlings saw the program. And he was very impressed with Bhakti Chita Maharaj's speech that he wanted to see the program again and again. And it was once a week the program was aired every Saturday. So when he saw the first program, the first Saturday, the following Saturday, he called the broadcasting house, the director of TV, and told him that that Hare Krishna program I want it again. That's the head of state. So the director of TV put that program back on the air. And the head of state watched it. And then again, the following, the following Saturday, he called the, 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 the broadcasting house and said that Hare Krishna program, please play, play it again, air it again. So the director of TV again put on the television the program. And so when he put it on the third time, the minister of information under which the television uh, broadcasting functions called the director of TV and questioned him, why are you showing the Hare Krishna program again and again and again? And the director of TV said, your boss ordered me to do that. And he said, who is my boss? He said, the president of the country. He ordered me to do it. And so, <laughs> and so when the minister heard this, he put down the phone. The phone went silent because he could not challenge. The head of state himself was asking for the program to be played. There was a very special program. They call it Morning Breakfast Show. That program was only for very distinguished international figures on the television program. It was live program. So, and a lady, a lady was in charge of this program. She was the host very tough lady. You can't break her. So I approached this lady and said, look, my dear Gifty, our spiritual master is coming into the country. He's a very special guest. I want you to host him on this program. And Gifty said, no way. That this program is not a religious program. It is meant for distinguished uh, visitors, distinguished politicians, distinguished statesmen, we don't bring religious people on this program. I said, look, our spiritual master is more than a religious personality. When you put him on this program, you will, you will like him and, you, and I assure you, you will want to put him on your program again and again and again. He said, no, she will not agree. After a long debate, I said, okay, let's, let's, let's bet. If you interview this personality and you are not satisfied with him, I'm ready to pay you any money you want. Even though I have no penny. <laughs> but I said, I'm ready to pay you any money you want. But if you like his presentation, then you must also interview him anytime he comes. So I said, all right, I agree. Bet, he wrote down, sign, I signed. <laughs> and then Maraj came. And then we went for the program. He, he had a special topic. And the way Marai discussed the topic, the way he handled the topic, she was very impressed. After we finished the interview, we went to the reception. And this lady, she was mesmerized by Marai's personality. He just said that, Swami, I want to marry you. <laughs> He was so mesmerized by his preaching, he was just thinking of nothing by himself. He said, Swami, I want to marry you. And Bhakti Maharaj looked at me <laughs> and smiled. and said, Srivast, tell her <laughs> where I belong. <laughs> so I understood. I said, Sister Gifty, unfortunately, he's a celibate monk. <laughs> he does not marry. So sorry. Your desire cannot be fulfilled. Then he said, okay, but can we be friends? And Marai said, yes. 
I'm a friend to everybody in this world. So you are also included in my friendship. And then, then I say, give tea. So what about the agreement? <laughs> the agreement we signed. I say, yes, you have won. You have won. I am very impressed with Maraj's presentation. I've never met anybody like this. This is the best so far I've had on this television program. And I guarantee that any time Marai comes into this country, I'm ready to interview him. So that was the quality of preaching that he did. That wherever he went. I also remember one, he, one devotee invited him to his church. The devotee belonged to a very big church. And he started reading our books. And he took interest in the, in the, in the philosophy. And he convinced his church authority, his church or elders, authorities, to allow Bajitita Marai to give a lecture in the church. When Marai spoke in the church, the church was divided. <laughs> it was divided. Some people want to join the Hare Krishna movement, and some people want to remain where they are. So, uh, the other devotee who introduced Marai to the church, he has to create a new church called the Church of Lord Ram. In order to accommodate those people who wanted to belong to the teachings of Krishna consciousness. Because they, 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 they love the philosophy and they, but, but a number of them were not, were not, were not ready to allow Marai to come there again and preach. So they decided that, okay, those who want to hear Maharaj again and again will form our own church. And then Maharaj can always come to that church and preach to us. And so a number of the members of the church, they left the church and they joined this Prabhu. He was called Anubhava Prabhu. They joined Anubhava Prabhu and he formed a new church called the Church of Lord Ram. And so... <laughs> That is the power of his preaching. And there are many instances, many places like that. Uh, I also remember that uh, that the, 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 uh, the police commander, the regional commander for the greater Accra, the capital of Accra, he, we happened to have attended the same school, but he attended, he was my first senior. When I went to school, he had already completed and left. But um, I got to know that he was an old student, and we got to know ourselves when I went to sign a document. Those days, for you to do Harinam on the street, for you to mount speakers on your bus, you have to get a police commander's signatory on a permit, otherwise you'll be arrested for making noise in the city. So, and you have to get the commander himself to sign the document. So when I went, I applied for the permit, and I had to go and meet the commander, I have to defend, you have to meet the commander and give reasons why you need that permit. So I met the commander, and he asked me a number of questions, why do you want the permit? Are you not going to disturb public peace? This, 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 this. I, I explained, and then he was satisfied, then he signed the document. But I was in Doti, Tilak, so he was a bit curious. After he signed the document, he said, Yantuna, where do you come from? Because he thought I was not a citizen. You know, but when they see people in Doti and Tilak and all this, they don't count you as a citizen. They see you as a foreigner. So he said, Yantuna, where do you come from? So I mentioned where I come from. Almost the same area where he comes from. He was surprised. Then he said, which school do you attend? And I mentioned the same school he attended. <laughs> he said, what? You mean we are all students of the same school? I said, yes. He asked me which he attended, I gave him. He asked me the headmaster, I gave. All the details, I gave. So that I was not faking. I knew about the school. So that from there, our relationship tight. So he said, oh, I didn't know that uh, uh, an old student of my school is the head of the Hare Krishna movement in Ghana. <laughs> now that I, I know any issues with police, 
come to me. I will handle it. So, our relationship started from there. And just around that time, Dr. Tita Marai was to come. So, I mentioned to him that my spiritual master is about to visit the country. Would you like to meet him? He said, why not? I would like to meet him. He's a spiritual authority. We need his blessings. So when Maharaj arrived, I told him that his police commander of the whole greater Accra wants to meet him. And Maharaj was, he was always very happy with such arrangements. He wanted to preach to important people in society. He was always very happy. So he said, all right, let's go meet him. But he said, I'm not just going to speak to one officer. Tell him that he should get all his district commanders to come. So that I, instead of just speaking to one officer, I can speak to all the leaders, police leaders in the capital. And once they all know about you, it will make things easier for you. So I went back to the commander and said, look, our spiritual master, you would not like to speak to just one person. If you don't mind, why don't you invite your district commanders so that Maria can speak to you. He will speak to you in privacy, but he will also speak to all of you in the group. What about that? He said it's a brilliant idea. Immediately he sent out a, a, a message ordering all the commanders to report. And the next morning, the whole office, his, his conference hall was full of police commanders. And Maharaj addressed them. He spoke about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Very powerful delivery. And all the police officers, they were very happy, they were very satisfied. The books that we carried, we carried books with us. Anytime we are going to Marai for preaching, we carry a lot, a, lot, a lot of books. They bought all the books from us that day. And then, after that, the police commander gave him private audience. They talked. He presented his problems, his challenges, and all that. Marai addressed them and all that. And then, after two days, or maybe a week, he called me and said, Do you know something? Your spiritual master is very special. He's very powerful. I said, what happened? He said, I want to tell you that I was supposed to be promoted to deputy commissioner of police for the last three years. I have been fighting with my authorities over this and I'm not getting any headway. But as soon as your spiritual master stepped into my office, the next day I was called by the IGP and I was told that you have been promoted. <laughs> so I can see that this is your spiritual master. He's very powerful. He is capable of taking off all the difficulties people have. Just see his visit has eased my problem. So, so he went and told the IGP about his experience of Bhakti Tito Maharaj. So the IGP, IGP means the Inspector General of Police. He's the boss of all the police. So the IGP also said, then I want to meet the Hare Krishna spiritual master. So he called me and said, that our boss, the Inspector General of Police, wants to meet the, your spiritual master. I said, sorry, Maharaj has already left. He doesn't stay long. One week, two weeks, he's gone. He said, until he comes back in another six months' time. So, all right, he told the IGP and they waited. So, when Marai came back, I told him Marai has come. Immediately, he called the IGP. At that time, he was no more the commander. They have promoted him. He's now in the IGP's office as the director of operations of things nationally, like that. So, I told him, I arranged for Marai to meet the IGP. So, I told him that Marai would not meet only the IGP. He has to meet all his deputy directors and all the lieutenants and all the big guys who are assisting the IGP. Marai always wants to meet these people. So he told the IGP, the IGP said, organize, call all of them. They should all be here. So when Marai entered the hall, all these big, big, big officers were all seated waiting for Marai. And Marai spoke to them, he addressed them, and they were all very satisfied. Again, all of them bought books. At the end, um, uh, the IGP said, all right, now you all see the spiritual master of the Hare Krishna movement. The temple is there. If you want to know more, go to the temple. If you want to meet him, book a private arrangement. Now it's my turn to meet the, the spiritual master, all of you, out of my office. And he sent everybody going. 
So I also got up, I'm carrying my bag, I want to go. And Mara said, no, she reversed, you cannot go. I said, but I give me said everybody should leave the office. So I'm also leaving. He said, no, you brought me here. So you must be here to see what the IGP is going to do with me. So I won't let you go. So the IGP said, no, 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 you can stay. I'm only telling my officers to leave. You are his assistant, so you must be here. So he stayed. I stayed with him. The IGP said, actually, to be the IGP, Inspector General of Police, means to be the servant of the head of state, to be the security officer of the head of state. And Wherever the head of state is going, you must send people ahead of time to do so much groundwork. You can't sleep. Them. Sometimes they call you in the middle of the night. They say it's a very difficult job to be an IGP. And sometimes you even have to work against your own interests. Sometimes they give you a service you don't want to do, but that's the order of the head of state you have to do it. So therefore, he needed some special protection, some special mercy from Marai, so he can be able to do the service. At that time, Mara used to have a special walking stick with the Shunker Dave head on it. That was a special walking stick. So Mara said, all right, I will bless you. This is the Lord of protection. He will protect you. So immediately the IGP, he knelt down before his guy. He comes from a Christian background. So immediately he knelt down before Mara. And Mara put the, 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 the Shunker Dave stick on his head and chanted the Shunker Dave prayer and asked for the Shunker Dave to very happy. He said, this is the first time I've heard such prayers. This is the first time I've lost such blessing. And I'm sure with your presence in my office, I will not have any difficulties again. So in this way, we can see how Maraj influenced different people. Even there was the director of prisons. He was like a, a disciple. He would travel all the way from his office to the temple just to be Maharaj, to attend his classes. So we can see that but Peter Maharaj was a very gifted preacher. And in fact, the situation now is his disappearance. Uh, as we all know, it, it started. How much time do we have? How much more time? Ten minutes. Okay. So, um, we all know how he disappeared from this well. It was 2004, the year Panchatatwa uh, deities were installed that Maharaj gave his Shema Bhagavatam class. I was in that class. And at the end of the class, he was talking about protecting Shila Prabhupada's house. And then he said he made some very serious statements. He said that whatever is necessary to make him a better servant of Shri Prabhupada's mission should be taken away from him. And whatever experiences he has to go through to become a better servant of Shri Prabhupada should be given to him. And he was requesting all his God brothers and God sisters to make such, such prayers before the deity of Shri Prabhupada in the temple hall in Mayapur. So that was his prayer, that whatever is necessary to make him a better servant of Shri Prabhupada should be taken away from him. Whatever is necessary to be taken away from him should be taken away, and whatever is necessary he has to experience should be brought into his life. So that was in March. And in August 2004, he had his cancer issue, his leg, uh, became affected with cancer in 2004. And he went for different treatments because some God brothers were telling him that that prayer he made in Mayapur was the cause of that cancer. So he should revert or reverse the prayer. The Marai said no. He, had, he meant the prayer. He meant it. That whatever was necessary to make him a better servant of Prabhupada, he was ready to accept. So if the cancer was meant to make him a better servant of Prabhupada's mission, he was ready for it. And so from August 
August 2004 to, to June 2005. He went through a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty, and finally he left his body in June. In fact, before he left, he had a dream that um, Krishna Maharaj has come to call him. The Prabhupada wanted him. So, uh, but um, Krishna Maharaj was shedding tears when he came to call Bhakti Tita Maharaj. So Bhakti Tita Maharaj is asking to Krishna Maharaj, but Prabhupada has sent you to come and call me, but why are you crying? And Tama Krishna Maharaj said that the vacuum, the vacuum you will create in the life of your disciples and your well wishers will be so much, it will be so intense that they will they will they will they will suffer for a long time. And that is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling the vacuum, vacuum you are going to create in their lives. That is making me cry. So anyway, but Tama Krishna Maharaj has brought the message and I think after one month thereafter, Bhakti Tita Maharaj left his body in Little Niagara on the 27th of, of June 2005. So the vacuum he has created because his preaching styles his dynamism, his approach is, is, is only known to him. I remember in 2006, His Holiness Jaya Maharaj came to Ghana on the request of Bhakti Tita Maharaj. When, when he visited Bhakti Tita Maharaj in Gitanagri, before he passed away, he requested him that he should come to West Africa and, and give Siksha to his disciples. So, 2006, Jai Padaka Maharaj came to Ghana. And that year we we're celebrating our 25th anniversary in Ghana. So we invited the vice president of the country. And the vice president had other engagements. He couldn't come. So he, dep he deputized one minister to attend the, uh, the, the program. And in that program also we invited the Catholic Bishop of Accra, the Amir of the, uh, the uh, Muslim Ahmadiyya Mission, we invited leaders from various religious groups and they all came to participate in our celebration. And so the, this minister who deputized for the, for the vice president uh, met Jayapalaka Swami Maharaj and they had some discussion. But after that, Jayapalaka Maharaj said, Srivas, you know, if Bhakti Tita Maharaj were here, the way he would have preached to this minister, he would have been able to make him a devotee. So he said, this is, this is the vacuum that Bhakti Tita Maharaj has created by his disappearance. That his way of preaching, his style of preaching is different. He's gifted in that area. And now he's gone with that uh, ability to touch lives. When Mara gave a lecture in South Africa in the presence of Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela was shedding tears. He was shedding tears hearing Bhakti Tita Mara giving a lecture, a public lecture. And after Mara finished the lecture, Nelson Mandela embraced Bhakti Tita Mara very tightly and everybody could see how much he appreciated Maharaj's speech. So, uh, he has created this uh, vacuum and we are still trying to, to, to fill up the vacuum. Uh, uh, Chandrabodhi Maharaj once he asked me, how is the preaching going in Ghana or West Africa? I said, Maharaj, we are trying to follow the full steps of Bhakti Tita Maharaj. He became very angry. He said, don't say like that. Who are you to follow the full steps of Bhakti Tita Maharaj? I said, Maharaj, we are trying, we are trying to follow his full steps. He said, don't say that you can't even try. I said, Maharaj, we are trying to follow his full steps. 
say, okay, that's good. You can try to follow the instructions of God to give them a But you cannot follow the footsteps of God to give them a He said, but you them a was up there. He's a very special creature. Krishna has empowered him. He's up there. He said, even I, I can't dream of that empowerment that Dr. Jitra Maharaj is given by Krishna or being by Krishna. Then he told us, he told me a story. He said, let me tell you one story. Out of many stories. Actually, can remember Maharaj, one of his one of his best friends. Um, that, that they were his fourth very close friend. Dr. Bonnie Maharaj, such another Maharaj, Radhana Maharaj, and Bhakti Chanu Maharaj. These are the, 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 the four friends. These are the four friends who were close. So, Chandramadhi Maharaj said, I will tell you one story that shows the class that Bhakti Tita Maharaj is in. And I can't even dream of being in that class. And that's why I'm heavy with you like this. I said, okay, Maharaj, please, what is the story? And he said once, he was in Gitanagri. And uh, uh, he, he arrived in the evening. There is a place called the Institute House. That's where Mar- Bhakti Tita Maharaj stays. And that's where all the visiting sannyasins, that's where they stay. So, Kyadramodhi Maharaj stayed with Bhakti Tita Maharaj in that place, in that uh, Institute House. And so, at that time, the mortgage had expired. The money they had to pay, the Gitanagri land is on rent. And so they pay in advance, maybe 10 years, 5 years, like that. And at that time, they, 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 it has expired. The rent has expired. And Maraj needed $30,000 to pay the rent in the next two or three days. Otherwise, they can, they, they can send them to court and they can eject them from the from Gitanagri lands. So when Bhakti uh, Chandramoli Maharaj arrived that evening, that was the discussion he had with Bhakti Tita Maharaj. Bhakti Tita Maharaj was mentioning to him that their, their, their rent has expired and he needed $30,000 to pay the rent, otherwise they will be in trouble. So they discussed that and they went to sleep. The next morning, they came for Mangarati program. Normally, wherever Bhakti Tita Maharaj is, he would do the arti on the altar. So Bhakti Tita Maharaj was doing the arti and Chandramoli Maharaj was leading the kirtan, the Mangarati kirtan. So after the kirtan, Bhakti Tita Maharaj approached Chandramoli Maharaj and said that, did you hear the deities talking when I was doing the arati? And Chandramoli Maharaj said, deities talking? We deities talking. He said, rather than Madara, they were talking when I was doing the arati. And he said, what did they say? He said, rather than Madara Maharaj said, I should go and talk to Dr. Henry. I should go and see Dr. Henry for the $30,000 for the rent of the land. So, Chandra Mollis Maharaj said, okay, here is Dr. Henry. Go and talk to him. Why are you talking to me? So, Bhakti Tita Maharaj left Chandra Mollis Maharaj and walked over to Dr. Henry. Dr. Henry had also arrived in the community a night before, and was just attending the Mangarati that morning, just like Bhakti Chandramoli Maharaj. So, Bhakti Jita Maharaj walked over to Bhakti Henry, and then they talked for a while. And then Bhakti Henry left the, the, the temple hall and went to the guest rooms and came back with an envelope of money, exactly $30,000. And gave it to Bhakti Dita Maharaj. So then Bhakti Dita Maharaj asked him, But how do you get this money? He said, Well, he used to buy things from a particular supermarket. And when you buy up to a certain amount, they will give you a coupon. And after a period of time, they will draw 
the coupons. And if you, you, you were picked, your coupon was picked, you were given a special gift. And this time around, when they drew the thing, his coupon was the number one. And he won a car. But he is also a car dealer. So he doesn't need a car. So he said they should give him the cash. And so the brand new car was $30,000. So they gave him the $30,000 cash. And he said, I don't need this money. This money is for Krishna. But he was thinking, which temple will I give this money to? There are many temples around where he was staying. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Gita Niagara, and some other places, Maryland, and other places. So he was thinking, where should I go? And he just felt, okay, let me go to Gita Niagara. So he felt the super soldiers directing to go to Gita Niagara. And when he came to Gita Niagara, it was in the night. He didn't discuss with anybody about that money. And Radha Damodara, they knew that he had brought $30,000 into the community and that money was to be used for paying the rent. <laughs> so while Maharaj was offering the arati to the deities, the deities were telling him that go to Dr. Henry and collect the $30,000. And he alone was hearing it. Even Chandramoli Maharaj, who was doing the kirtan, he didn't hear. So after the kirtan, when he asked him, he said, I have not heard. So, the money was given to him. So he went back to Kandramoli Maharaj and said, this is the money, $30,000. So, so Kandramoli Maharaj said, this is the person you, you say you are following in his footsteps. Can you follow in the footsteps of this person? I said, no, Maharaj. He said, you can only carry out his instructions, but you cannot follow his footsteps. He's far above there. He's talking with Krishna. Krishna talks to him directly. Even I don't hear Krishna talking to me directly. He, therefore, Bhakti Chita Maharaj is, is not someone you can just say you want to follow his footsteps. You can only follow his instructions. So, the vacuum that he has left in West Africa in his preaching is yet to be filled because his presence was so much felt by all the politicians, by television stations, by radio stations, by newspaper houses because he was such a dynamic preacher and we cannot fill that gap till this very moment. So that is our lamentation that He's supposed to have stayed longer to train more of us or some of us in this his dynamic way of preaching so that we could continue with his style of preaching. But these are some of the few uh, points I can share with you. Hare Krishna. So, any question, comment, <laughs> we end here. Yes. He, t he personally told us that story that um, he went to the Jagannath Temple. You know, he, he, he wore a, 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 a turban. He put on a turban. And so the, the pandas took him as a, a, a devotee from South India. <laughs> they didn't see him as a, as an American, African American. They saw him as a devotee from South India. So they, they allowed him in. And because he wore the, the turban, they could not see his African hair. So he, he entered. And then he, he said, even he went very close to the Jagannath deities, and the pandas even dragged him closer and gave him a gallant from the Jagannath. And then he went out. Then he had the courage to come again the second time. <laughs> because he, he went the first time and they didn't detect him. They didn't discover 
his origin, he was thinking, let me go again and have a more closer darshan of Lord Jagannath. Because the first time he was a bit, you know, afraid that they may detect him and all that. But they didn't. Even he said when they were pushing him towards the altar, he was very afraid that maybe they may detect that he's not an Indian. Especially if they are going to ask him to speak Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be exposed. So he was careful not to talk to anybody. But after they gave him the gallant, he left. He felt that he had the courage to come back. At the main entrance, they didn't check him. But when he entered, some other pandas, not those who he met, some new other pandas noticed that this guy is not Indian. So they ran after him. They wanted to catch him, but he, is a, he was a sportsman. <laughs> so none of the pandas could catch up with him. He was so fast, he escaped. And he left the, the, the temple. But he actually went, had Lord Jagannath Darshan, had a garland from Lord Jagannath, had Prashadam, but <laughs> the first time, but the second time, they chased him out <laughs> of the place. Like that.